Welcome to the Creative Community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is artist Peggy Ferris. Peggy, welcome. Thank you. I'm really psyched to have you here on the <laughs> on the show. <laughs> we uh, we were talking. We went to your studio some years ago. Yeah. Um, and we got you now here in our studio. <laughs> so okay. um, it's I, I really want to catch up with the the, the work that you've been doing, um, you know, recently. But before we get into these fabulous images that we're going to look at. Can you remind viewers, you've got an interesting story, you know, you, in, on your website you, you were, said you grew up in 50s Americana, mm. you know, 60s, you were still young, went to college in the, the 70s, and yeah. then you went off to Holland. Yeah. Um, that must have been a pretty big deal. It was a pretty harebrained scheme. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted, I had graduated from college, right. and I just still wanted to pursue art, although right. I wasn't allowed to do that while I was in college. Why not? Well, my dad thought it was very impractical, so I yeah. had to make up a story about what I was going to do, right. and um, it was a story. Right. And so after college... So by that you mean a lie. <laughs> a lie. <laughs> and, what did I say? <laughs> right. And so um, after college, I took some classes at City College for a couple of years right. in art, and I really loved it, and design. And then I decided I wanted to go to Europe, mm -hmm. and I decided I wanted to go to an art school. Mm. So I found one in Holland that I could go to where I didn't have to learn the language. Right. So I, I got a 10-month charter, and I went there, and I ended up staying two years right. and learning Dutch. And eventually, the second year, I went to the Royal Academy. And in just that short period of time, I got an unbelievable education mm -hmm. in design, just classic design. And um, then after that, I came back, and I eventually went to Art Center, and that was really my training mm -hmm. in actually graphic design. What What is a classic education in design? What do you What do you learn in just the basics? Um, all the basics: color, form, composition, mm -hmm. line, mm -hmm. typography. Okay. Um, it's just you know hands on mm -hmm. mixing paints, mm -hmm. mixing colors, hand lettering in those days. Oh wow. To really learn the forms mm -hmm. and how to control mm -hmm. and get what you want right. by hand, because there were no computers then. Right. So after going to, in Pasadena, you're coming back to Santa Barbara, and you started your own design company. Yeah. For twenty plus years. Twenty years or so. Yeah. Yeah. I started out in L.A., but it didn't really work out. I kept getting fired from jobs. <laughs> it just didn't work for me, yeah. and so I said, "That's enough." Yeah. And so I just moved back here. And I opened my own business, and it just took off immediately. Mm -hmm. It was just the easiest thing. Yeah, and what sort of uh, work did you do during that time? I started out doing work for computer industries, and then eventually I got into um, doing work for real estate developers mm -hmm. and financial investment companies. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of coffee table books, and mm -hmm. then I did a lot of work for the hotel industry, a lot of brochures. Mm -hmm. So it was really basic stuff. Yeah, yeah. but then at some point you said, Enough of that, I want to get back to my, my true passion, right? To the fine arts. Yeah, well, it happened accidentally. I was really burning out mm -hmm. on doing graphic design. I had done it for 20 years. And um, while I was in Holland, I had developed a style of painting called hard edge. Mm -hmm. And I always thought I would get back to it, but I just didn't know when. And so I had been playing a lot of tennis at the time, and I hurt my wrist, and I had to use a Wacom tablet. So you're using a stylus instead of a mouse. Uh -huh. And so one day I was just talking on the phone to someone and fooling around with this. I had just gotten it, it was like a new toy. Mm -hmm. And I started doodling. And there was this amazing doodle I saw. And I thought, this is an eight foot painting. Oh, wow. And so that was it. I said, I'm doing this. And then I started dropping my clients and I learned how to paint. Uh -huh. And that was my first you know, phase of work were hard edge paintings. Yeah, that's a big step to take <laughs> just to drop a successful business and I was and sick of it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so you've you've done so much work so hard edge but then now I, I don't necessarily think of you 
in that mode, right? No, it's completely different. Yeah. yeah. How, how, how would you describe that difference? Um, it's much looser. It's mm -hmm. a form of painting I refer to as gestural abstraction, okay. where you're just very loose and making a lot of marks, mm -hmm. and the, the painting just unfolds as you go. Mm -hmm. And that mark making is just crucial for what you do, right? Yeah, I, re I didn't realize this till several years into it, but it's, it's always been a part of my paintings. Mm -hmm. um, just making lots of marks within the materials have changed over the years, mm -hmm. but um, that's been the one consistent theme throughout my work mm -hmm. are the marks. And it's interesting because as you go along, you develop your own language right. of marks. It's sort of cryptic, mm -hmm. but it's it's what it's you, you do. Yeah. 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 Well, we've been talking for five minutes or so. Let's take a look at what we're talking about and, okay. and take a look at the first image. Yeah. Um, as we do, I'll, I'll let you kind of talk viewers through what, so what they're seeing. So the first six images I'm showing here um, date to around 2016. And I had been having a lot of workshops in my studio for a year or so, and I hadn't been painting quite that much. So I was invited to show in a pretty high profile show and I had to get some work together. Right. And I just started out of the blue working on panels and I wasn't really sure what I was doing, but these pretty cool pieces started emerging and they were much more minimal than I had been doing in the past and the, the color palettes were really um, almost monochromatic. And I found a very calm feeling in these paintings. Yeah, this one definitely. Yeah. yeah, and I actually realized it was a product of the new environment I was in, which was in the foothills in the Chaparral. Mm -hmm. And it's very stark up there. And there's a stillness to living in that kind of rural environment. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I think I was referring somehow to that feeling of stillness and these little stunted pieces of imagery and just scrawled lines and there's a scratchiness to these pieces that I think I was feeling from being in such a natural environment for the first time, particularly the chaparral. So these were the first pieces that um, I did after this little hiatus and um, actually during this show they sold really quickly yeah. and I thought this is really interesting. I've never had quite this kind of experience and I really felt there was something there. And um, in addition to these, the scratchy surfaces um, created by the lines and sanding on these panels and so on. And what are the panels made out of? They're masonite. Okay. And the actual surface itself is very smooth. So there's a little bit of a um, um, divergence between the imagery, which is sort of rough and scratchy, mm -hmm. and the actual tactile surface of the panels which are perfectly smooth, oh, wow. and I really like They do like not look that, that way on, on, no, the, on the they're, they're TV No, they're absolutely screen. perfectly smooth, and that's another aesthetic point I was developing at this time, was to get control of the actual surface. So the paints I use are very thin, and they're scraped on with painter's scraping tools, and sanded back a lot, mm. and covered over, and like with all my paintings, I start out with a lot of underpainting. Mm -hmm. So what you see here is a really reduced version of what was originally on the panel. Okay. So I'm, I'm reducing by covering over, in this case, with blue. And well, yeah, um, Let's hold on this one for a second because, I mean, this is, to me, a, a beautiful image. I couldn't necessarily tell you why <laughs> I think that. There's something about, obviously, the way that the black is, you know, interfering in a way with mm -hmm. the blue. Um, there's there's a, almost a representational aspect to down. If I start to look at it like a cloud, it looks like it could be some sort of an, a beast with teeth down there in the <laughs> lower left Everybody hand corner. Everybody has their own interpretation. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and I, I clearly I don't think that was that's part of it, but there's something about it that's really evocative, and yet it it's pretty plain in a way, right? I mean, it's very minimal. Yeah, yeah. so what what is it about that, that that is appealing to our aesthetic sense? I'm not really sure. It's so, I think it's different for everyone. For uh -huh. me, it's um, there's always sort of like um, the juxtaposition of really refined and really funky and scratchy okay. and, and quirky and weird. So I think the blue part is a sort of a refined surface. Mm -hmm. And then there's just these raw elements in the black. Mm -hmm. And I like seeing them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this piece is actually called Chaparral, and it kind of refers to those um, spiky 
shoots that you see coming up out of the ground. Mm -hmm. They're just total survivors, these mm -hmm. plants out there. Mm -hmm. I live out in probably about as far up as you do also. And, and there is a sense, of, of, like I said, of quiet. Um, but I don't, as a poet, you know, I, I, I would always be looking for some image or some correlation yeah. um, with, with a plant or animal. This is evocative of that, but it, it, I wouldn't necessarily take this to the average person on the street in Santa Barbara and say, you know, does this, what does this evoke? And I don't think yeah. you'd get chaparral. No, I don't think so either. Um, but, but it's still, for you, it's, it's something that, you know, it's, that's the, the essence of it in a way. Well, right? it's really, it's not exactly an exact representation of it. It's Clearly more, not, yeah. more of the energy of it. Uh -huh. You know, the starkness of the area up there mm -hmm. and just the way these plants are just driven to survive. Right and just keep going year in and year out and they have their death and life cycles and they come back and it's it's almost eerie. It is. Yeah. The land up there. This is a very still piece. There's a certain balance in this piece. It's called Things and Thoughts. Hmm. And why is that? Why is it called that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> They're things and then they yeah, provoke the thoughts. thoughts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, and, and again, it's just, it's, you can see the work of a, of a true artist, someone who somehow has, takes these, as you say, minimal elements, and they're, they're arranged just so that it, it yeah. feels like, oh, this is... Well, it's the, the arrangement is actually accidental, right. because what I'm doing is I have a lot of underpainting, which is very chaotic, right. and then I'm just picking out and saving the best parts and editing everything else out, mm -hmm. and then what I have left, I'm... Um, sort of outlining by eliminating, you know, by surrounding with red the parts I don't want. So there's still that, you know, I hate to say it, but there's still the designer's eye, you know, okay. looking for the best parts. Okay. But what I like about this process is that it's not predetermined and it's not designed in advance. Mm -hmm. It's just happenstance mm -hmm. as far as where the pieces are that you want to keep. But, but part of it is then knowing when to let well enough alone, right? Yeah. I mean, do you ever find yourself going too far and then uh, retreating back or? I try to know when to stop. Uh -huh. yeah. And I've, I've gotten a sense of that and it's kind of interesting. It's, it's not when it's completely finished, it's when it's almost finished. Oh, wow. Because I think in that sense, you know, the average viewer will so go the in viewer did too. with their eye and yeah. almost complete it. Right. It's like if it was too perfect, it would become very static, uh -huh. I think. Yeah. So just before it's done, just it's done. leave it slightly unfinished. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. there's just one or two things, and yeah, you know. Yeah. Just like. Well, those are, that's a great, great group of work. Um, so th th those were of a piece, and we're going to look at a, another sequence yeah. of, of the next six. Um, you know, in in the first, the ones that we just saw, the mm -hmm. first six or so, I was really focusing on getting that minimal look, and mm. then as I developed the technique of working with these masonite panels and sanding and scraping paint on and and making marks into it and then sanding back and revealing the marks again, I found that the technique had so much to offer. And so in the next six or, I say six or so, um, the compositions become a little bit more complicated okay. because a lot of it is happening by accident. Mm -hmm. What occurs um, on the panel as I'm working with these? And I kept discovering new techniques. So it was really exploring the process of making these paintings as much as going for a more minimal look. And so they become a little bit more complicated and in some ways more interesting or more active. Mm -hmm. And so if we, yeah, yeah here we go. Yeah, we're we sort are, of yeah. starting to see some like happy accidents occurring, like in this one with the yellowish blob at the bottom. And I found that, you know, this technique I was using was really conducive to accidents and occurrences I could not have anticipated. Mm -hmm. So I really like that part of it. And, and for this one, what's the title for this? This is called Shoots. Okay. And it's referring to just green things coming out of the ground, shoots. Mm -hmm. um, this is a pretty recent piece. It's called Big Top because it has these little triangle shapes at the top. And it's a fairly big piece. There are two panels about 
36 by 36 each, and it's fairly monochromatic. It was done very quickly. So it's got, I like it because it has a freshness in the marks and it's not overly worked. And when you're, it's, when you're selling these pieces, uh, do you ever see them in people's homes? And what, what's, I do. <laughs> yeah, and what do they do to a wall, to a room? I think they bring a lot of life force into uh -huh. a room. You know, original art is, it has an energy in it. Mm -hmm. And um, you can't replicate that in a print. Yeah, you know, yeah. this is one of the um, last pieces in this first section I'll show. I wanted to start working larger, and so I, um, t I had I had this idea of creating a small panel next to a long panel, and this was one of those attempts, and it was really difficult to pull off. But this piece I like a lot. It's called Yard Sale. <laughs> <laughs> and it sort of refers to these random things that you find on the ground, and they're all sort of randomly combined. And it's a fairly big piece. It's 30 by 90. Wow. Yeah. It, it, so the things you find on the ground refers kind of to foraging, too, because that's, yeah. that's something that, yeah. that you're interested in. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about that. Well, foraging um, refers to you know, it could be something you do anywhere. You could be at the beach and be looking for beach glass, or mm -hmm. you could be buying apples and want to find just the perfect apple. Mm -hmm. You're always looking through things. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's what I'm doing with these paintings. I'm looking for things that I want to keep mm -hmm. and that seem precious to me. Mm -hmm. And you're looking for them as images that you remember? Are they photographs or how, notes? How, how do you remember those things? I mean, is it, you're foraging. I mean, as you walk through life, are you literally mentally foraging things? See, I want to, I want to hold on to this image here. Well, I, I, or, or I is mean, it, it could be just what you're doing while, it, while you're in front of the canvas. Both. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be something as simple as walking down the street, and which I did when I first moved into my place. It was just so barren, and I'd walk down to the bottom of Via Chaparral, and I'd be looking at stuff that was just left in the street, mm -hmm. and finding these really interesting pieces of wire and. Just metal and stuff. And would that you just literally end. pick them up? Yes. And, yeah, yeah. Take them back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting stuff. Quirky stuff. Right. And and then the, the the magic is like, how do they come together? How do yeah. they, How do you juxtapose one against the other that they yeah. they are evocative rather than ludicrous? Right. Yeah. Well, there's a little bit of both. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know, there's there's a tipping point where, and that that's to me one of the interesting things about talking to someone like you who I think of as a very successful and um, astute artist and just somebody who's taking a painting class and, and trying to do exactly the same thing, walking up and down their street foraging and not having that sense of, of how those things might go together in yeah. a way that would um, that I would find beautiful or you would find beautiful or the person yeah. themselves. What is that? What, I mean, I'm trying to ask you, what's the magic of art? What's the... Well, I just think it's a trained eye, and it's knowing your own aesthetic. Uh huh. So it's practice, partly, and definitely, and knowing, yeah. definitely, it's mileage. Yeah, mileage. <laughs> High mileage in some cases. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's also knowing what what it is that you want, yeah. what what you yourself find to be yeah, beautiful. Yeah, my aesthetic. Yeah. I think is um, very clear to me. Right. I like things that are really funky and quirky right. and right. unusual. Right. And you know, sort of juxtaposed against a sort of refined backdrop. Right. So it seems to be what appears in my work. I finally figured yeah. it out, and yeah. it's sort of, you know, the way I dress, the way I dance, the way I paint, the uh -huh. way I decorate. It's sort of it's sort of a continuum that goes through right. all the parts, you know, of your consciousness. Right. Well, and it's really sophisticated. I mean, you you told me before. I don't ask me about my influences, but I I, I feel like that your work is sort of echoing a lot of abstract art, you know, even if, if it doesn't, it's not conscience, or yeah. conscious to you, right? Yeah, I, probably. Yeah, but that's not, that's, that's not something you think, oh, um, this is like this, or I'm, right now I'm referencing this person. No, I it. really don't. The only thing I can tell you is that when I saw the work of Basquiat, mm -hmm. it was so loose. And when I saw, first saw his work, I was still a recovering graphic designer, which mm -hmm. meant that I was sort of a little like rigid in terms uh -huh. of how I was painting. Uh -huh. And it was my hope to become that loose and that stream of consciousness mm -hmm. and that random because it's sort of the exact opposite of being a graphic designer. It's just sort of completely random yeah, as opposed to completely designed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 
Let's take a look at the, the next um, bunch of images here and now uh, sort of set us up uh, for what, okay. what we're going to look so at. So the next images um, are much less refined and they're done very quickly and they're on a surface called Ramboard. And I discovered Ramboard when I was having workshops at my studio and okay. I was covering the tables with this stuff called Ramboard. It's a material that they use to cover floors with during construction. Okay. So it's very humble and it's biodegradable. You know, you just put it in your yard and say goodbye if you want to get rid of it. So I found um, that it wasn't really working very well to cover tables with, but nevertheless, I found it interesting to paint on. So what I did was I took all these cardboard pieces off of the tables mm -hmm. and I thought, what would happen if I painted on these now? So I just started painting on them and it's an incredible surface to paint on. It's got a certain toothiness to it. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing these pieces on Ramboard. These are um, generally about three by three and I do them in a series of two at a time. And so- Why is that? I just wanted to have a big mm -hmm. um, diptych I okay. could uh, work with and have enough space to really explore. So I'll do two at a time. They're very big and they're done very quickly and um, with minimal colors, mostly mm -hmm. black and white. Mm -hmm. And um, there's much less refinement going on. So there's, I start out once again with all the underpainting, which is a lot of chaotic paint and marks. And then I'll do a little bit of refining to just define the spaces a little bit, but not as much as on panel. So the next six or so um, show just that effect of being in the moment with these pieces and the, you can see a lot of the marks mm -hmm. that I'm making, which normally I would cover up so much more, but they're just fun and they're really raw and the material is so humble that you can take a lot of chances that you might not normally take. Just because it's so cheap, <laughs> you can throw it away. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's so cheap to work on. Uh -huh. So I, I had a lot of fun with these. Yeah, and it, you know, again, they're echoing things that we've just seen in the yeah. previous series, but, yeah. but they're but they're really different. Like you said, the, the, the sense that this is done quickly, yeah. um, in a way where a, an inspiration is captured, I think that's, that's definitely yeah. there. What's this piece called? They're all, they're all called Terra, Terra okay. one, Terra two. Terra meaning earth. Right. And I also think that the inspiration for these pieces came from living on a property that just has sort of vast amounts of land. I'm surrounded by vast amounts of land. And um, just the earth colors were very calming to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're, we're both kind of left speechless here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go, there you go. They are good. But they're, they were super fun to work on. Like, you know, these two, um, I forget this, what number this is, Terra number six or something. These two ones with the green in them, I probably did these together in three hours maybe with wow. one day going in and just touching things up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but this has a little bit more of the graphic designer going on. You can see there's some horizontal and vertical lines and right. spaces and division of space. You know, it's hard to get away from being a graphic designer because once you know the rules, you can't forget them. Yeah, but th that's clearly helping you out in, in, yes, in a, in a, in a, in a piece like Yes, in a lot of ways, this, yeah. yeah. It's a good fallback. Then I started um, a couple of these. Th this one and the next one are both super minimal. They're pretty small pieces, about 18 by 18. And I sort of did a lot of weird stuff underneath these that wasn't working. And then all of a sudden, I just put a bunch of black paint down and I just scraped it off and there was this really wonderful blob of black, mm -hmm. which feels really archetypal to me, these forms and just the stark simplicity of it. I like just having that to sort of fall back on. Tell me a little bit about working in, in series um, because that, you know, that's something that obviously that you like to do. Yeah. Is it you're trying to, are, are you seeking the perfect image or is it just that I want to have as many different variations on what I'm seeing at, at, the, at the same time, you know what I mean? Well, I work in a series in order to just um, completely exploit everything I possibly okay. can from that. Tr it's like a train of thought. Right. And after 20 or 30 pieces, it's pretty much done. You feel like it's, you've exploited I've that I've said it, thought. I've done uh -huh. it. Yeah. And either I have to switch colors or medium, mm -hmm. 
or do something else for a while or just, you know, do a remodeling project. <laughs> do <laughs> something yeah, else. No, and that's why I was, I'm curious about that with artists too because we were just talking to Chris Potter who talks about painting every day. Um, and, and I was saying, as a poet, sometimes I try to do that and, and I feel like I just hit a wall and, and mm -hmm. I've got to stop. I need, I'm, I'm just doing the same thing. I, it, things are getting worse and worse. Yeah. You, do you feel that way? Like, it's oh, just yeah. like, okay, this is, this yeah. is it for this particular go yeah. out. When it's done, it's done. Yeah. I mean, at the end of a series, it starts losing life force. Mm -hmm. And oh, okay. it's just, you know it when it's happening. Yeah. And so I'll take a break and I'll... So, I mean, do you literally remodel your head? What sort of things <laughs> do you do? do? <laughs> All sorts of things. I like to see space change. Right, so yeah. I'm always dreaming up some, <laughs> some harebrained <laughs> idea. When, when, but when we are looking at those things, are, is, is, are they coming from the actual mark making themselves or do you, are you seeing it beforehand or is it a combination of the two? You mean the paintings? Yeah, the paintings that we've just been looking at. Oh no, those are, I can't anticipate what's gonna happen. That, that's they're, entirely. They're completely in the moment. Okay, yeah. everything is. Yeah. This last piece is interesting. Um, it's one of my most recent pieces. It was done on panel, but I wanted to sort of have a little bit more of the looseness of the Rambord pieces. So it was an experiment. I like how it turned out, and it's getting a little bit more complicated than most of the pieces mm -hmm. on panel, so I like how this one turned out. Yeah, and it, it, this is a, a bigger piece? It's pretty big, it's 30 by 60. I'm gonna come back to the studio in just the short amount of time that we got left. I do want you to give some advice to aspiring uh, artists. Um, what, what are some of the sort of core values that you could um, throw out to them in about 45 okay. seconds, 45 seconds to a minute? Yeah. I, to me, it's all about mileage. Uh -huh. And you just have to keep painting and painting and painting. Mm -hmm. And um, look at work that you like and try to figure out what you like about it mm -hmm. and why. And it's sometimes also helpful to just emulate an artist and mm -hmm. just try to, what would it be like to paint like this artist paints? And you learn a lot from doing that. So as you're going along, before you have your own style completely set in stone, not that it's always set in stone, right. but um, it, it's helpful to look at what other artists do, but it's also all about mileage mm -hmm. and painting as much, as much as you can. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that's, it's okay to, to make bad paintings along the way. Or yeah. it's, it's inevitable. Yeah. You're just and the more you paint, the better you get. It's, yeah. You know, there's no real shortcut to that. Right, yeah. Well, that's a good piece of advice. Yes. <laughs> Peggy, it's been a real pleasure to, to, to talk to you and to look at your work with you. It's just, uh, wow, <laughs> really <laughs> Thank exciting. You. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. The Creative Community is produced in Santa Barbara with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation. It's directed by J.P. Montalvo with the help of his fantastic crew. I'm your host, David Starkey, and we'll see you next time.